It's a tool that's supposed to help you avoid fraudsters. Utah keeps a list of people convicted of white collar crimes. But a Get Get Part investigation found that many, many names that are supposed to be on that list are glaringly absent. Three years ago, Utah created this first of its kind registry called the White Collar Crime Registry. It works sort of like the sex offender registry, except instead of being full of people convicted of sex crimes, it's full of people convicted of financial crimes. But my team combed through thousands upon thousands of court records and found some gaping holes. Michael Doros has a reputation for taking other people's money. His long history of financial crime convictions stretches back to the 2002 Olympics and beyond. David Alfin is a repeat offender of identity fraud and was most recently convicted of stealing a dead woman's identity in more than 50 grand. John Zane Jepson, repeatedly convicted in investment schemes amounting to millions of dollars stolen. By Utah state law, those convictions should have landed all three men here on the state's white collar crime registry. So Eric's on there. But not one of them is here. And our investigation found it is a troubling trend. We combed through more than 5,500 court records, focusing on cases that should have landed somebody on the white collar crime registry. Things like insurance fraud, securities fraud, and theft by deception. In total, we found more than 101 names missing. That's about one third of all the names that ought to be on this list. By our count, about a third of the people who should be on this registry are not on this registry. What's your reaction to that? Well, I'm disappointed, but I'm not entirely shocked. David Sonnenreich with the Utah Attorney General's Office says the registry has a major flaw. You see, it's the responsibility of prosecutors and offenders to report names to the registry, but there's no penalty if names are not reported. For us, I can't even find them $10 if they don't come and register with me. But, Sonnenreich says, he is now going to use our research to make the registry better. So we were really, uh, as I say, uh, glad that you did the research and found these additional people who we will now put on the registry, um, but concerned that this shows that the reporting systems in the registry are not adequate and need to be improved. As a result of all of this, the AG's office is now also taking our research to state lawmakers and asking them to beef up the registry, give it more teeth, so that people who don't put their names on it could face some punishment. If you've got something you want me to investigate, give me a call. My number, 801-839-1250, or you can email me, Gephardt, at KUTV.TV. Guys, take a moment and think about your favorite restaurant. Now, try and remember, how did you first hear about the place? Did maybe somebody tell you to check it out? Make no mistake, that kind of word of mouth makes and breaks businesses. But as you are about to see, it can be all too easy to hijack a company's reputation online and all too difficult to go after those who lie. Ramen Nation has only been open a couple of months, but owner Justin Hoyle says he's already getting rave reviews from his customers. People love the environment. They love that we're here in the community. They love that there's ramen now in Lehigh. That was until about six weeks ago. Ramen Nation's Facebook page got slammed with a pile of nasty reviews. Complete garbage. Racist employee. Not family friendly. Disrespect for the elder. It's like the ramen was cooked in a bucket of mud. And more bad news for Justin. Those nasty reviews came with one star ratings. And our rating on Facebook before that was a 4.9 and it suddenly shot down to a, a 3.7. Justin says normally he would take the feedback and try to improve his restaurant, but he's pretty sure these reviews are fake. Take a look. All of them posted within about one hour of each other. We're really concerned because um, Reviews are an important way to draw new customers into your restaurant. So who is behind the reviews? Perhaps one unhappy customer or maybe a competitor trying to smear his business? Or could the reviews be real? Justin says he simply doesn't know. He has reached out to Facebook to ask. I've tried calling their headquarters. I've tried emailing. And it's really hard to get through to a person. Well, Justin got through to me and my team began digging. Meet my longtime producer and Facebook professional stalker, Cindy St. Clair. Looking at Ramen Nation's reviews, she quickly noticed some red flags. Most of them aren't from Utah. That's right, reviews from out of state, but what's more, they all come from folks who opened brand new Facebook accounts right before Ramen Nation was blasted. What a quinky dink. But here's the real kicker. No, they've been stolen. These are all stolen They're photos? They're ripped off. How do you know? Well, using an investigative trick known as a reverse image search, 
Cindy was able to find that several of the photos that reviewers were using as their profile pictures actually showed up on other websites, including this one taken by a professional Utah photographer. So I called the photographer and asked if the photo and the profile match up, and she said, no, that's my sister-in-law, and that profile is not hers. We need to take a more proactive role. And Facebook certainly is no stranger to fake accounts being created to try and influence users. The company's CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, was grilled by lawmakers just this year. Among the questions, how fake news and bots were used on Facebook to try and dupe people. We reached out to Facebook to ask about the reviews posted on the Ramen Nation page. The company spokesperson wrote, quote, Over the past year, we've gotten increasingly better at finding and disabling fake accounts. Facebook says in some cases, before the accounts are even created, thanks to, quote, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Facebook says people who spot fake reviews should flag them. So, what can you do if you're defamed by a liar? Well, you can sue, says First Amendment attorney Jeff Hunt. And people tend to think that they can say anything on the internet that they want with legal impunity, and that is not the case. You are just as responsible for the statements you make on the internet, anonymously or not, as you would be saying it to in face to face or writing it uh, to someone. The trouble is, suing is hard. It's, you know, it's time consuming, it's expensive to hire a lawyer. And these types of cases are especially hard. To win, first you have to figure out who posted it, then you have to prove the review is false, then you have to prove how you were harmed, and at the end of all that, you have to hope that the person you're suing actually has any money. And you cannot go after the guys with the deep pockets. Can I sue Facebook? No. Um, you can sue them, but you probably won't win. Hunt says that under the law, Facebook's pretty much just a bulletin board. It's the person who posted that's responsible for what is said, not the bulletin board. We just want to have real people giving us real, real reviews and not have to worry about uh, people making things up. As for Justin, he says Facebook did remove about half of the negative reviews after he complained, but he's worried it could happen to him again and put him under. We must have an enemy, but I, I can't figure out who it would be. Professional online lying is actually an illicit business. We found places online where people can actually go and buy positive or negative reviews, sometimes for as little as five bucks. If you got something you want me to investigate, give me a call. My number, 801-839-1250, or you can email me, Gephardt at KUTV.TV. Think about this. By law, here in the state of Utah, most businesses must have liability insurance just in case somebody gets hurt. But one notable exception to that rule, daycares in Utah. He'll never be... They don't think he'll ever walk or talk or eat again. Two years ago, Shalise Musal lived every parent's nightmare. Her one-year-old son, Kasten, was badly hurt at his daycare. He was in a coma for three weeks. A worker at the in-home daycare facility had tried to contain Kasten in a playpen by putting a picture frame over the top of it. Kasten tried to climb out, but his head got wedged between the playpen and the frame, cutting off oxygen to his brain. Shalise says it caused extensive brain damage. Before he was perfectly normal. I mean, he ran around with his twin and client was a monkey, climbed up everything. He's like a newborn baby again. The daycare worker was convicted of child abuse and sentenced to 80 days behind bars. In the meantime, Shalise has had to quit her job in order to take care of her son and Kasten's medical bills keep coming and are not cheap. Shalise and her mom, Carrie, began looking at other options to help cover these out-of-control costs. It was only then that they learned their daycare provider did not have insurance. It was shocking. Shalise asked us to investigate, and as we began digging, we quickly learned that no child care provider in the entire state of Utah is required to carry insurance in order to be licensed. How does that compare to other states? Well, we reached out to every single state's child care licensing department, and here's what we found. Utah is one of 14 U.S. states that do not require insurance. 13 states require that all providers have insurance, while 14 only require daycare facilities to have insurance. You don't have to have insurance if you're running a daycare out of your home. Six states don't have any requirements at all, but do have rules that parents must be told 
if the provider does not have insurance. Oh, big fall. Liz Hamilton is the president of the Private Family Child Care Association of Utah, an association for folks who run child cares out of their home. Liz runs a child care out of her home. And she is well aware that kids will be kids. As safe as we make our environments, though, kids will always find something. They will, and, and it only takes seconds. They'll figure it out within seconds. Liz recognized the risk, and it did prompt her to buy an insurance policy. You have insurance. Yes. Why do you have insurance? I have insurance to protect me and my family, to protect the families that I care for their children. But barriers to doing so exist. Liz says a quick poll of her group revealed some of the reasons why not all providers are willing to purchase insurance. The cost. Um, some insurance companies don't offer it. With that, we turn to the state of Utah's child care licensing folks. Administrator Simone Balavar says because of Katzen, the rules are likely going to change in this state. The state wants to require that all daycare providers make it explicitly clear to parents whether or not the daycare has insurance. We will only be asking if they do have liability insurance. If they don't, then we will be checking that they uh, let parents know in writing that they don't have it. Bolivar argues that the proposed rule change is not an overreach. And it is easy to do. We're not forcing providers to have liability insurance. So you left one. Caston's family says it's a good step, but they hope to see more done to protect families from the unpredictable with a law requiring providers do carry insurance. I'd like to push it a little farther. I'm not 100% sure how, but I'm not ready to give up on it. By phone, we spoke to the owner of the daycare where Caston received his injuries, and she told us she would support the rule change and actually support it going further to require that all daycares in our state must have liability insurance. She says that after all of this, she got insurance for her business, and it only cost her about 300 bucks a year. If you've got something you want me to investigate, give me a call. My number, 801-839-1250, or you can email me, gephart at kutv.tv. The guy who contacted me does what he calls scam baiting. Anytime a scammer calls him on the phone or reaches out to him through his computer, he keeps him on the line and tries to waste their time to try to keep other people from getting ripped off. But in doing so recently, he accidentally stumbled onto just how much some of these crooks are getting away with. We have been alerted with identity breach in your computer. When the scammers call, your computer may be crashing. Bring it up. Jerem call gets to work. This is a Linux installation here. Scamming the scammer. Something I enjoy doing, wasting these guys' time. Jerem enjoys it so much, he's actually built this fake computer dedicated to the tech support scam. You know, where the scammers lie and say they're from Microsoft and they need you to give them access to your computer? Well, the G goes to the H. H, you get a J. The A key just doesn't work. They're getting frustrated, but they don't know something's truly wrong because sometimes it works. Waste their time. It's the sport of scam baiting. But Jerem says one day a scammer messed up and accidentally gave Jerem access to the scammer's computer. What Jerem saw inside were the names and bank accounts of tons of people being ripped off. He was shocked. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Jerem says that in the time since the scammer's account was set up last October, about $300,000 has been processed. Our investigation found that these criminals make off with truckloads of money. According to the FBI, Utahns lost $10 million just last year to scammers. Nationally, a whopping $1.4 billion was sent away. And those are just the numbers of the people who reported it to the feds. The numbers are staggering. Jeffrey Collins is a supervisory special agent with the Bureau. It is his job to fight cybercrime. He says that while the idea of messing with the crooks is admittedly amusing. I mean, I, I could see why it'd be very tempting for people. The FBI does not recommend it. You should probably just leave it alone. Keep in mind, these crooks probably have your name and phone number and address, if not more. Make them mad and they may harass you more. Or hang up the phone. Um, usually if you do that, it, you know, the person will leave you alone. As for Jerem, he opted not to leave it alone. I would like to talk to somebody about a fraud concern I have regarding a, an account there. Armed with the names of victims and where they bank, Jerem began calling banks and letting them know that their customers were being ripped off, hopefully shutting down some of the wire transfers. He says he's not going to stop. For every minute they're on the phone with him, it's a minute they are not ripping off somebody else. Or if there were enough people that are scam baiting, just wasting these guys' time, suddenly it doesn't work for them because all of their calls are to people that are going to just mess with them. We also reached out to the company that is hosting the scammers' transactions. It declined to comment.
you've got something you want me to investigate, give me a call. My number, 801-839-1250, or you can email me, Gephardt, at KUTV.TV.